We are in the middle of a series called Romans Road, and tonight we're going to talk about the mind of the Lord. If you've not been with us, we're journeying verse by verse through the book of Romans. And as we're through this journey, the first 11 chapters of the book of Romans are really doctrinal tra- chapters. They deal with pure, unadulterated doctrine. Doctrine in its purest form. And then from chapter 12 to the end of the book, it deals with all the application of that doctrine. But, in every chapter, there's application. Every verse we read in the scriptures, there's something for us to gain. There's something that we can grow in and look towards and just really, really be moved by. And so tonight, we're ending up a serious section of this scripture. From chapter 9 to chapter 11, it's dealing with the transition from Israel to the church and then back to Israel in future times. And so some very difficult chapters, but chapters that are rich in in, uh, doctrine and also rich in application for us. So we're going to pray and we're going to get right into this. We're going to look at Romans chapter 11 verses 13 through 36. We have a lot of scripture to cover tonight, so let me pray and we'll just roll right into this. Father God, I thank you so much for who you are. I thank you for your loving kindness. I thank you that you've granted us, Lord, with life and life everlasting for those who have come to you by repentance and faith. I'm thankful, Lord, that you rescued us from the dominion of darkness and you've brought us into your kingdom of light. And Lord, I'm just so thankful for the way that you love us, the way that you care for us on a daily basis. And I pray, Lord, that tonight as we look at your word together and as we worship you together, that you would just move powerfully in our lives, move powerfully in our hearts. And I pray, Lord, that you would show each one of us through your Holy Spirit exactly what it is that we need to be moving on, working on, growing in. And Lord, encourage us also where we're doing things that are glorifying to you. Lord, it is our honor to praise you. It is our honor to glorify you. And I pray that we would do that in everything we do tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. I've had a pretty bad sore throat for about three or four days now, so my voice is going to be a little bit all over, and it's just uh, I'm congested and got all kinds of stuff going on. So anyway, you can be praying for me as I'm sharing tonight. The first thing that we're going to look at tonight is grafted in. Grafted in. Now, if you're just joining us tonight and you haven't seen what's coming, what's come before this in the rest of chapter 11, some of this might look a little foreign to you if you've not studied this book, but we'll do our best to try and break it down. I am talking to you Gentiles. Inasmuch as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I make much of my ministry in hope that I may somehow arouse my own people to envy and save some of them. Interesting passage. This is a carryover from last week because remember, the book of Romans is a single letter. It wasn't broken up into chapters. We've done that. But it was a single letter with a thought that was prevailing through the whole thing. And so here he says, I'm an apostle to the Gentiles. That was Paul's call. He was called and set aside, if you remember when he was called, he was called and set aside to be an apostle to the Gentiles. Not a word we use often today, but simply those who are non-Jewish, those who are not of Israel. That includes the majority of us that are gathered here tonight. We are Gentiles by birth. And Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. The other apostles that had come before him predominantly dealt with Israel, with the nation of Israel, with the, the Jewish people that were in their area. And he says this, I make much of my ministry. Not him making much of himself, not him bragging about who he was or what he was doing, but he makes much of his ministry with this motivation, that I may somehow arouse, stir within his own people and stir them to envy because Gentiles were coming into the kingdom so that some of them might repent of their ways and be saved. So Paul like us, had a passion, a desire, a a, a zeal for his own people. Just like we, if we look at our sphere of influence, we have a passion and a desire and a love for the people that have been placed into our lives. And so Paul, knowing that the focus on the nation of Israel had shifted into the church age on the church, and he knew that he still had this great passion and his desire to see Israel saved. Now think about this. The nation of Israel was God's vessel or his vehicle to come into all the nations to bring the message of Jesus Christ. And because they had repeatedly disobeyed that direction from the Lord, now the Lord raised up the church 
after Jesus came, raised up the church, and the church now became the primary vessel in the world to bring the gospel message to those who desperately need it. That's the age we live in now. And think about this. Now those Gentiles, who the Jews did not care very much for, who now have grabbed hold of the gospel, would now be the very tool, as they are saved, that would make Israel jealous or envious and want to come back into the kingdom of God or enter into the kingdom of God. Pretty amazing when you think about the scope of affairs and the things that go on in our world. God is using us, Gentiles, to stir up a great desire for him among the Israelites because they've lost focus. Pretty interesting stuff. What does that have to do with us? How do we apply something out of that? I believe 1 Timothy 4.16 is key for us as we think about this. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Now you say, Matt, what does that have to do with the passage we're looking at? Well, if we truly are a vessel or a vehicle because of our salvation for those who are in Christ Jesus to be used to stir up Israel so that they might come to salvation, if that's true, then we need to think about our testimony. We need to think about our witness in this world. This scripture is powerful for our everyday walk. We're to watch, study, diligently observe, pay attention to our life and our doctrine. And we're supposed to do it closely. Pay attention with great care, with great observance to two things. To our life and our doctrine. And here's what I've learned about life. When my life, when the application of my life, the way I live, when it is in line with the doctrine that I say I believe, then, because of the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, there is power in my witness and my testimony to a lost world. When my life is not in line with the doctrine that I say I believe as a follower of Christ, then my testimony and my witness is not strong. In fact, it is weak, and I am not used as much as I can be used for kingdom work. So if we watch, observe, care about our life and our doctrine closely, persevere in them, continue on in them, because if you do, if you persevere, you are proving that you truly are a child of God, that you truly have been saved, and by doing so, you will prove your own salvation and you will be used as a powerful vessel to see others saved. Now, if we know as Christians we have one purpose, to bring glory to God. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10.31, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do it all to the glory of God. That is our bottom line purpose, to bring glory to God. And if we understand as Christians we have one mission, to go to all the nations and to make disciples, if we know that that is our mission and we know that is our purpose, then we need to pay attention and watch our life and doctrine closely because as we do that, our witness will be strong. We hear so often today, at least I do, as I'm talking to people who are not followers of Christ, about the hypocrisy within the church. I hear it regularly. The truth of the matter is, according to God's standard, which is holiness, every one of us in this room is hypocritical at some point. Is that not true? Do we not all fall short of God's standard of perfection and holiness? Now, here's what makes us not hypocrites. We recognize when we stumble, stumble, falter, and sin that we can go back to Jesus Christ who is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We can repent of that sin, turn away from it again, and be in right standing with Him. We get that. Those who are observing, however, when they see the general practice of our life is no different than the practice of their life, when they see that there's nothing different about us who claim to be a follower of Christ when they claim not to be, why in the world would they want that Jesus? See, they want something. They want something. And they're watching us to see what we have. But if we don't shine the light of Jesus Christ brightly by our life and our doctrine, what are they attracted to? 
What is it that they would really want? It's got to be different. Very important. Back to our main text. Verse 15. For if their rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? If the, if, part, if the part of the dough offered as first fruits is holy, then the whole batch is holy. If the root is holy, so are the branches. Now here, painting a little bit of a picture, an agricultural picture of, to some degree, and then a picture with dough and talking about yeast within dough. Here the picture is if, if Israel was holy in the beginning, Israel's going to be holy in the end. And we need to understand that. There is a future focus coming that's going to be again on Israel. They still are the nation that was chosen by God. And we're not going to get into all of that because we don't have time to get into all of that. But we need to understand that. We also need to understand this concept of first fruits. Because I believe it's something that's not understood greatly by Christianity today. We can go all the way back to Exodus 22. And here's what we find. Do not hold back offerings from your granaries and your vat or your vats. You must give me the firstborn of your sons. Do the same with your cattle and your sheep. Let them stay with their mothers for seven days, but give them to me on the eighth day. See, there is a concept with God starting all the way back in Exodus in which we would dedicate to Him the very first or the best of everything we have. The best of the harvest, the best, remember in Israel, the heir, the first, the, the male, the first male was the heir and would receive everything. Give that and dedicate that back to the Lord. All of the first fruits was the focus. And it goes on. Look at in Exodus 23. Celebrate the feast of harvest with the first fruits of the crops you sow in your field. There is a celebration. There is a dedication of giving back to the Lord. We've seen it with the firstborn. We've seen it with cattle, with sheep. Now we see it with crops. In Exodus 23, 19, a couple verses later, it says, Bring the best of the first fruits of your soil to the house of the Lord your God. Again, a dedication. A giving up of something that was ours. A putting before the Lord. In Leviticus, we find this. Speak to the Israelites and say to them, When you enter the land I am going to give you, and you reap its harvest, bring to the priest a sheaf of the first grain you harvest. And again in Deuteronomy, I know this is a lot of scripture, but it's important. You are to give them the first fruits of your grain, new wine and oil, and the first wool from the sharing of your sheep. For the Lord your God has chosen them and their descendants out of all your tribes to stand and minister to the Lord's name always. Speaking about bringing that to the Levites, and that was their provision from everybody else giving of the first fruits. In Proverbs, it's stated this way. Honor the Lord with your wealth. With the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. There is a principle from beginning of scripture to end of sowing and reaping. Without a question. And we as Christians still need to recognize that every good and perfect gift comes from God above. He owns everything and he gives it to us in whatever proportion he decides and we are simply stewards of everything he's given us our time our talents our abilities our finances our material goods it's all by him and it is a blessing and we still need to have the concept of honoring him with the first fruits now, many of us who are brought up in Christianity, particularly here in America, have been taught the concept of tithing, literally to give a tenth of everything that we have when it comes to particularly our finances. And I just want to say this. First of all, you can go back onto my YouTube. It's in the, well, it's not in the bulletin because we don't have one. But you can go back onto my YouTube, Matt Gaines 1220. And you can go back and look at a message I preached when we were going through 1 Corinthians and actually into 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 says this about our giving. It gives us several principles that giving needs to take place because I cannot find a direct correlation between the Old Testament tithe, which for Israel was really a taxation system. Some years it was 10%, some years it was 23 and a third percent. 
And it was their taxation system to take care of the temple and to take care of the Levites who ministered in the temple. Here's what I find for New Testament giving when it comes to money. And like I said, there's a whole message on it you can go back and look at. Our giving is to be sacrificial. It says it point blank. Our giving is to be consistent. It says it point blank. Our giving is to be done with a hilarious, literally is the word, a joyful attitude. It's supposed to be joyful, and it's supposed to be sacrificial at the same time, and it's supposed to be consistent at the same time. And we need to understand that those are the principles, along with the fact that it is supposed to be done as we've determined in our heart. See, it's easy if I stand up here and I tell you, hey, by the way, the Bible says you're supposed to give 10% of everything. That's easy. It's been decided for you. But if I tell you that the New Testament teaches and you go home like you're supposed to with everything you learn and check it and make sure it's accurate and right and you've tested it and you say, wait a minute, this is what it says in the New Testament for the church era that I'm supposed to do this, 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 and this. And you have to determine in your own heart what God wants you to do. You see, that entails a relationship. That means I've got to get before the Almighty God, creator of the universe, and I've got to commune with Him and have Him speak to my heart and have Him lead me for the next six months or the next year or whatever it is that He speaks to my heart as I consistently give, as I sacrificially give, as I joyfully give. He needs to speak to my heart and say, here's what I want you to give. And maybe He'll speak to your heart and say that I want you to give a tenth. Maybe he'll say, that's a start point. Maybe he'll say, no, I want this out of you. You see, the church has lived in fear. And out of fear, the church has tried to command what people do in the giving of not only their money, but the church has tried to demand it by giving of their time and their talents. And we have literally overburdened Christians with commitments that I believe look godly on the surface, but are not scriptural or godly underneath. Ministry should be born in the church when you come to one of the leaders of the church body that you're a part of and you say, God has laid this on my heart and this is what he wants me to do. And the leaders of the church and the church body should come alongside of you and say, yes, we confirm that with you and we're going to walk in that with you. There's nowhere in the New Testament where I see that the elders of a church say, oh, we're going to do this, 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 this. Now come on and join in. There's nowhere where that's the format. There's nowhere in the New Testament. Now, do the elders of the church direct the affairs of the church? Absolutely. It's what it says in Hebrews. But it does not say they create, nor do they do all the ministry. Every one of us is minister, are ministers. And every one of us has a responsibility to give of our first fruits, including our talents. And as God stirs something in your heart, you need to, I need to respond. Sorry, I started chasing a rabbit there a little bit. That was a free five minutes right there. Verse 17, verse 17. If some of the branches have been broken off, and you, how would you like to be called this? Though a wild olive shoot. Why don't you walk up to somebody tomorrow and call them that, you wild olive shoot. See how they respond to that. Have been grafted in among the others, and now share in the nourishing sap from the olive root. Do not boast over those branches if you do consider this you do not support the root but the root supports you what's going on here in historical times at this time period in Israel which was rich with olive groves and I've seen a little bit of this because in Portugal which by the way is the greatest country on the earth other than the United States but in Portugal I will tell you I will tell you that there's lots of olive groves and literally, they'll take branches of different kinds of olive trees and graft them into one root, into one trunk, and it produces tremendously. Well, here's the way it worked in Israel. They would take the cultivated branches, and they were grafted into the wild root, the wild trunk. Because the wild olive trees wouldn't produce. But when you put the cultivated branches into the wild trunk, they would find that it would produce way more than the cultivated trees. But God, like he so often does in this description, takes the wild branches and grafts them into the cultivated root, the cultivated base, the cultivated trunk, which is a picture of Israel, and lets the wild branches benefit 
from the blessings that Israel was given. God often does that which is opposite of what goes on naturally or what goes on culturally. And this is just another example. We, who have come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, have been grafted in. Now understand, there's a lot of bad teaching today where in which people tell us, well, that makes us Israel. Unless you're born in Israel, you're not Israel. Oh, we need to practice Judaism. No, we don't. We need to practice being the church like God laid it out. But understand that because we're grafted in, we get the benefits of what has been given to Israel in the fact that we now have access to the throne of grace. We now have access to the God of blessing. We now have access to eternal life. We now have access to everything he's given us. All because we've been grafted in. But understand, we're not to boast over that. We're not to get prideful over that or arrogant over that. Look what he says next. You will say then, branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in. Granted, given, that's a fact. But they were broken off because of unbelief and you stand by faith. Listen to this. Do not be arrogant, but be afraid. For if God did not spare the natural branches, Israel, he will not spare you either. You see, the fact that we've been given entrance to the kingdom of God should humble us. It should humble us. The fact that we've been included in the riches of God and the blessings of his kingdom should humble us. And may we never become arrogant towards Israel. May we never become arrogant towards the cultivated branches and prideful. Because if God didn't spare Israel when Israel wouldn't come to him and sin against him, why would he spare us? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And we need to understand that. There is a holy awe that we need to understand. And when you look at the God of love, understanding that he's also a God of wrath, we need to understand there is a holiness and a reason for us to be in awe of him. He has a standard. And we're going to see it a little bit further. In Matthew 21, it says it this way. Therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. He who falls on the stone will be broken to pieces, but he on whom it falls will be crushed. When the chief priests and Pharisees heard Jesus' heard Jesus's parables, they knew he was talking about them. They looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet. See, Jesus predicted this time would come. He prophesied that it would come. And he told them directly, and they knew what he was talking about. But instead of humbling themselves and yielding their lives to him, they got proud and arrogant and stood against him. And many of us say, man, how could they do that? And then we look at our lives over the past week and the sin that we've participated in, and we really should be asking, how could we do that? Because in essence, every time we walk into sin, we're rebelling against his holy standard. In John 15, 6, it says this. If anyone does not remain in me, stay. A permanence is given the picture there. He is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. You see, for the Christian, one who truly comes to Christ, we are to persevere to the end. We are to walk till the end. In fact, by walking to the end, we'll verify that we truly are in him. And one more scripture in this section. Acts 18.6 But when the Jews opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes and in protest, in protest and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am clear of my responsibility. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Paul's general practice when he came into a new region was to go into the synagogue. When the synagogue rejected his message and the truth about God, he moved on to the Gentiles. And that was his practice. And we have been, a have been blessed as a result of that if we're in Christ Jesus. And that's great news. But we need not be arrogant about it. Second point, temporary change. 
And for those of you who are time watchers, you're thinking, man, that first point took a long time. Don't worry, the second and third are not as long. <laughs> Temporary change. Consider, therefore, the kindness and sternness of God. Have you put those two words together when you think about your holy God, the one that you serve? The kindness and the sternness of God. You see, God is fully loving when he is kind and when he is stern. He is the same, a God of love. And sometimes in our modern culture, we've created this viewpoint of love that is not a scriptural viewpoint of love, but it's this lovey-dovey, everything feels good, it's always going to be wonderful, everything's perfect, and as long as I do the right things, my life's going to be a piece of cake. That's not a description of love according to the scriptures. In fact, Jesus said, if you follow after me, guess what? Persecution's going to come your way. That's what's going to happen. And so we need to understand that he's perfect in kindness and in sternness while being perfect in love. Consider, therefore, the kindness and sternness of God. Sternness to those who fell, but kindness to you, providing that you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. This section of scripture is talking a lot about perseverance. It's talking a lot about persistence. It's talking a lot about continuing to walk in the Lord. There are many people in our culture who have walked down an aisle and said a prayer, who have asked Jesus into their heart, common terminology that we hear, and who have never been transformed have never been changed by truly encountering him. Now, I'm not the judge of that. You're not the judge of that because we don't know anyone's heart. But God says this very simply. It's provided that you continue to walk in his kindness. That is the verification that you're really in him. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. If that is the general practice of our lives, we are verifying that we are truly in Him. If the general practice of our life is un unrighteousness, unholiness, if it is general just uh, living by the flesh, guess what? We're verifying that we're probably not in Him. And we might need to take a look and ask Him to take a look into our lives and our hearts. This concept of continuing and walking in is a serious concept. Look at Luke 8 and verse 15. But the seed on the good, so on good soil stands for those with a noble and a good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering produce a crop. That is Christianity. You hear the word, you retain it or grab a hold of it, believe it, and then you produce a crop. That's Christianity. That's the life we're to be living. We heard it. We grabbed hold of it. We retain it. And we continue to live according to it. And God works through us and produces a harvest, a crop. Christianity. John 8, 31 and 32 says it this way. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If key word every time you see it in the scriptures. If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. See, we hear that second part of the scripture quoted all the time. Man, if you hold to the truth, the truth will set you free, brother. It's all good. Notice what it comes after. It comes after, if you hold to my teaching, you verify you confirm that you really are my disciples. And then, we don't have it up there, but in John 14, Jesus says, if you love me, you obey my commandments. We walk with him. Again, not perfectly, but humbly. And when we stray, we repent and we get back on track. Anybody about a thousand this week? Anybody walk perfect with the Lord this week? No faltering, no stumbling, no sin. We know we aim towards that. And the great thing is we know when we falter and when we stumble, we turn back to Him. And we repent of it. We confess it to Him. And we confess it to anybody else that we've offended or sinned against. And we receive His blessing. 
we receive his forgiveness. And we need to understand that. But there is a lot about perseverance. Romans 2, 7 says, To those who, by persistence in doing good, seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. You cannot be changed. And I can't wait for next week's message. Romans 12, 1 and 2. We're going to talk about this concept. You cannot be transformed or changed by Jesus Christ and then walk any way you want to. When you meet Jesus, He changes you. He changes you. It doesn't mean we're perfect. It doesn't mean we've got it all figured out. It doesn't mean we understand it all. But there's something different internally. And we live in a different way. And we work through that process the rest of our life. Back to the main text, verse 23. And if they do not persist in unbelief, they, Israel, will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. After all, if you were cut out of an olive tree that is wild by nature, nature and contrary to nature, were grafted into a cultivated olive tree, how much more readily will these, the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? They were cut out, we were grafted in, they're going to return, and when they do, they'll be grafted back in. They being Israel. I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number, and we don't know what that number, of Gentiles is, has come in rather. Now that doesn't mean every Gentile. It means the full number. Whatever God has sovereignly planned. And so all Israel will be saved. That also doesn't mean every single Jewish person. But again, the focus is on the nation of Israel coming back into the forefront of all that's going on. It is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins, Isaiah and Jeremiah. And again, the focus is talking about the future. And we need to understand that. Last point, ultimate glory. Ultimate glory. As far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies on your account. But as far as election is concerned, they are loved on account of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. For God's gifts and his call are irrevocable, can't be changed. Why? Because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Why? Because he doesn't change, the scripture tells us, like the shifting shadows. Just as you, who were at one time disobedient to God, that's us. That's every person in this room. Have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience, so they too have become disobedient in order that they too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. That's that picture. Israel, church, Israel. For God has bound all men over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them all. I think the danger sometimes in walking for a long period of time in our life with Jesus Christ is that we forget about his mercy. That we take it for granted. Think about it. Do you remember the moment that you yielded your life to Jesus Christ? Do you remember that burden that was lifted off of you? The sin that you were delivered from and will be futuristically completely delivered from? You see, that is experiencing His mercy. But here's the great thing about our God. The Bible says that His mercies are new every morning. And we don't have to count on yesterday's mercies or a year ago's mercies. We have His mercies new every morning. And may we stay humble so that we can focus and understand that His mercies new every morning, that His grace is delivered to us in abundance so that we might walk in the manner that He wants us to walk. And then Paul ends with this doxology. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. Have you thought about that? We just know in part right now. In our finite minds, we can't grasp it all. But oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. 
How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? That's from Isaiah 40 and verse 13. Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. That's a quote from Job 41 and verse 11. Here's what I've learned from studying this section of scripture. I've learned that it's only by mercy that I've been saved. Don't deserve it. Wasn't good enough. Could never do enough good in this lifetime. But by mercy and through grace, he called me to himself. And he gave me an opportunity to enter into a relationship that has eternal consequences with him. And by repentance and faith, I entered into that relationship. And I received that mercy and I live in it every day. And so do you if you've given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the first thing we need to recognize is we need to be humble, not proud. The second thing we need to realize is that we've been given a mission. And that mission means to tell others about this Jesus that we say we love and we follow. This is not about religion. This is not about meeting one time a week. This is not about some religious choices. This is about a relationship with a true, holy, and living God that spurs us on and gives us passion and zeal to tell others about Him. And the stronger our walk is with Him by guarding our life and our doctrine closely, the more power we will have in our testimony. great thing about that is God works in spite of us often and still uses us even when we may not be walking the way we should, thankfully. But there is power in walking in righteousness. There's power in walking in holiness. In fact, if we are in Christ Jesus, we have resurrection power living within us in the person of the Holy Spirit. And that's where our testimony and our witness needs to come from. And then lastly, we need to understand that He has called us to persevere. Life is not often easy. It is not always fair. It is not always simple. And it is not always great. But in the midst of whatever life circumstances are, we can rest assured that we serve a sovereign God who has not left us, who has not forsaken us. We learned in chapter 8 that He abundantly gives us in the midst of those times and guarantees goodness in the midst of those times for us, even when it doesn't feel like it. He takes care of us in the midst of that. None of it is out of his control and we can count on him and rest in him. Those are things that we've learned, a few things we've learned through these first 11 chapters. And like I said, I'm very eagerly looking toward 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16. And so here's what we need to know. If you are a follower of Christ, then you need to understand what that means that you've experienced His mercy, and as a result of that, that we need to walk in a life that's striving for righteousness. If we're walking in sin, and we're not repentant of it, we need to repent of it. And we need to bring it to the cross and ask Him for forgiveness. And we need to share that in community with our brothers and our sisters so they can help us walk through it. See, being vulnerable is a blessing. But understand that most of us have been vulnerable and have gotten hurt and so we don't want to do that again we're fearful of it we have all these things in our mind that we think are going to happen but when we walk in community we are better together than we ever will be alone it's just a fact it's the way god designed his local church to operate so we need to recognize if we're in him and we're not living right get right and let's live for him in power if we're living for him and we are living generally right, then let's continue to grow and encourage one another so that we might edify the body and be used by him more powerfully. And if we're here and you're saying, Matt, I have no idea what you're talking about. I've never entered into a relationship with Jesus Christ. I don't even know what that means. But God's stirring in your heart and you say, I want to follow this Jesus. Then you can do that tonight. And you can yield your life to him. It cost him everything. In essence, it cost you nothing except submission to the King of Kings, which really is a great cost. And what you ultimately are saying is, I'm going to give up control of my life and give you control. And here's what I know when I came to that point, is I hadn't done so well on my own. 
And so surely God can do better in control of my life than I was doing. And maybe you're in that same boat. And so I simply want to end tonight by giving you an opportunity. If you have never encountered Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, then I'd like to give you that opportunity. So if you would, if you just bow your heads and close your eyes just for a minute. And the only reason I do that is just so that you can get alone and do business with God. There's no magical formula for you to, to close your eyes and bow your head and now everything's wonderful. It's not that. It's just a time to give you alone with God. But if you want to encounter Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, and you've never done that before, I want to give you an opportunity tonight. Simply pray this to your Father in heaven. Father, and you can pray out loud or quietly in your heart. Father, I thank you for tonight. And I thank you for Jesus Christ. And Jesus, I recognize that I'm a sinner. And my sin has been against you. And I ask you now, Jesus, to forgive me of my sin. To cleanse me, to wash me, and to make me new. And I now, by faith, place my trust in you. To follow you as the Lord, the Master, the boss of my life. Jesus, I ask you to be my Lord and my Savior. I will repent and turn away from my sin and follow you, believing that you've been raised from the dead and are seated at the right hand of the Father. In Jesus' name I pray. With all heads bowed and all eyes closed, if you've prayed that for the very first time, just so that we might help you in your journey, would you please just lift your hand up so that I can help you with your journey? Just one, another. Very good, very good. Let's pray. Father God, I am thankful for you. I am thankful for the way that you work in us, through us, among us. I'm thankful that you are a holy, awesome, and sovereign God. And I'm thankful that you teach us through your word. And you grow us. You mature us. And you move in our lives. I'm also thankful, Lord, that at times like tonight, that you draw someone or people to yourself and that they yield and decide to follow you and accept the mercy that you so graciously have given us. Lord, I pray for this church body, the journey, and I pray you'd continue to grow us, that we would be a body that truly shares life together and that we'd want to serve you and glorify you. I pray that we would not get caught up in religion, but we'd be caught up in a relationship with you. And as an overflow of that, we'd be caught up in a relationship with others. Lord, may we truly be used of you powerfully to honor you and glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, next Sunday, um, we're going to meet here again at 6. But at 4 o'clock, um, we have a family up in Mesa, our church up in Mesa, um, we have a family, the entire family, all four people has given their life to the Lord just a couple weeks ago. And actually three of them a couple weeks ago and one of them on um, Thursday night. And they want to follow up with believer's baptism. In the scripture, it says repent and be baptized. And so that's the proper order. And baptism is symbolic of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. It's also symbolic of our old way, death to that, and our resurrected life in Christ Jesus. It is a step of obedience after we follow Christ. And there are some of you here that have given your life to the Lord that have not followed in believer's baptism. I remember when I got baptized after following Christ. I had been baptized as a baby, but that was my parents' decision, not my decision. Once I repented, read the scriptures, and learned, I then wanted to get baptized. So next Sunday at 4 o'clock at the Courtyard Marriott where we normally meet and where we'll go back to meeting in a couple months once their renovations are done, we are going to have a baptism service there for this family and for anyone else that has followed Christ and has not followed him in baptism. If you need to learn more about what that is, let me know or Dave or Mark or whoever it is that brought you and we'll be glad to share with you what baptism is all about. And please come and don't, de don't delay being baptized. Let's understand it. Get baptized so that you're walking in obedience with him. So if you have any questions about that, I'll be hanging out afterwards, as will these other guys, and please feel free to talk to us about that. But next week at 4 o'clock, and if you're not getting baptized, still come and celebrate that opportunity at 4 o'clock in the pool at the Marriott Courtyard.